Good morning to you all. Welcome to our midweek service. It's Wednesday. And uh, we want to thank you, viewers and listeners, for taking your time to hear the Word of God. We don't take it for granted, but it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that calls you to listen to these messages. So we just want to say thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we begin to understand your amazing plan of salvation, we are to come through a perfect, sinless kinsman, Redeemer. We begin to understand the incredible significance of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the nation of Israel. For through them was to travel God's promised human seed, who was to be born as the Holy Eternal Son of God into the race we, which he himself created. Thank you that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And thank you that he died to pay the price of the redemption of the whole world. Thank you that Jesus rose again to give us new life. Thank you that he is my redeemer who dwells in heaven and lives eternally in my life. We pray for the nation of Israel that they will one day come to national repentance and cry out to him who comes in the name of the Lord for salvation. This I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I would ask Ben to come and read the word of God from the book of Exodus, the first chapter and second chapter. Good morning, church, and it's uh, a great Wednesday. I hope you're all blessed and um, ha having a good week. I um, encourage you if you need to come, if you want to come to church on Sunday, give Paul a call and book in. Today's a good day. Uh, today I'll be reading from Exodus 1, 1 to 22, and Exodus 2, 1 to 10. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Ishakar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites exceedingly were exceedingly fruitful, they multiplied greatly, increased in numbers and become so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, we'll join our armies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labour. They built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labour in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all, their harsh in all their harsh labour, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose name was Shifra and Pura, when you are helping the Hebrew, Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. The Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now chapter 2. 
Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. She placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slaves to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This, one, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and became her, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. And this is the word of the Lord. Now I'll ask Johnson to come and share his message again for today. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you, Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. I do welcome you all again. Uh, our theme today is a deliver is born. A deliver is born. The river now is the longest river in the world, snaking 4,160 miles from Burundi, Africa, to the Mediterranean Sea. And in this beautiful, exotic, life-giving river lives, lives one of the most fearsome creatures in the world, the crocodiles, Nilocticus, the Nile crocodile. The 12 species of this strong, ferocious creature watch from the shores ready to spring and devour an unsuspecting animal or a human. Hardly a place to hide a child, a beautiful child, in fact, nowhere in Egypt was it safe for a Hebrew child to be born and live under a paranoid pharaoh like Ramses II. From 1290 to 1224 BCE. Human crocodiles were on the pro on the Nile banks, in the streets, in the back alleys, with instructions to kill every Hebrew male child they could find. In this setting of Pharaoh, Paronia over the rapid growth of the Hebrew people. A Hebrew couple from the tribe of Levi married and a baby was born. A beautiful child to the father, Amram and mother Jacob, in Exodus 6, verse 20. This child would not be left to the human reptiles. The child was placed in a basket, plastered with bitumen in the reeds of the Nile. It was a safe place. Sister Miriam had to watch over the child. The anonymous writer to the Hebrews explains, by faith, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months after his birth because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's verdict, edict, in Hebrews 11, verse 23. So five strong women played roles in the saving of this child. Shepreya and Pua, Jacobed, Pharaoh's daughter, and Miriam. So the two brave midwives, Shepra and Pua, defied Pharaoh's orders and allowed the children to live. Pharaoh's orders were clear. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women, see them on the birth stool. If it is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, she shall live. Exodus 1 verse 16. However, the midwives, Shepra and Pua, feared God more than Pharaoh and Every boy child was born was saved. They defied the king's orders. So Mother Jacob and Father Amran, motivated by faith, put away their fears. Jacob, whose name means Jehovah's glory, could think of nothing but protecting the child. God's gift to him. Jacob boldly became a risk taker and went against Pharaoh's 
killing fancy. So Pharaoh's daughter, unnamed and unlike her, murderous father, is overcome with compassion as she approaches the Nile River for a bath. She takes Pete on the child and orders him to be pulled out of the water. She adopts the child as her own, although a princess. She does not do the actual tending of the baby. He then becomes a prince in the palace. So the child's sister Miriam waits and watches the child in the basket from the shadows. At the proper time, Miriam steps forward. She offers her own mother, the child's own mother, as a nurse. The arrangement is sealed. We meet five women of faith, compassion, imagination, and ingenuity, who save the child whose name in Hebrew means, I drew him out. He is the one drawn out. He is Moses. So the literal meaning of Moses is saved, delivered by God. Your name and my name is Moses too. We have been drawn out of the dangers of sin, death and the power of the devil. Our Savior is not any other person but Jesus Christ. He saved us from the wrath of sin. What compelled such drastic, courageous, and life-saving acts on behalf of the future deliverer Moses? Jacob's family, which numbered 70, was safely in Egypt. However, Joseph and his generation of all die off, and new generations of Hebrews appear. These folks were exceedingly successful. But the Israelites were fruitful and prolific. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. In Exodus 1 verse 7. So this account of the Israelite population explosion in Egypt fulfills the Lord's promise of numerous progenies to the patriarchs. In Genesis 13 verse 16, 15 verse 5, 26 verse 4. But a new king comes to power in Egypt who does not know or does not care about the Hebrews. An earlier pharaoh had called Joseph incomparable wise in chapter Genesis 41 verse 39. But this king either restrains that history or is simply ignorant of the great contribution of Joseph. That he once been the administrator of food. That Joseph once been the second in command to Pharaoh. So this new king does not know about Joseph. So this new king says to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. So what do we do? Kill them. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. They will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Fear and paranoia consumes the new king. His security is threatened and is now thinking of killing innocent people. So the new king has a solution to the Apiru problem. Apiru refers to the Hebrew people and land as folks. Pharaoh oppresses them with hard slave labor. He is ruthless in imposing tasks that makes their life bitter and miserable. Forced labor, the new king reasons, will sap the vitality and productivity of the Hebrews while constructing public buildings, canals, irrigation, other public works. They would build the great stores at Pithom and Ramses, which archaeologists today have confirmed as two of the most likely sites of forced labor. But the hard Hebrews continue to flourish, no matter the conditions. Oppressed people in every age have been able to identify with the Hebrews, subjected to slave labor. God is on the side of the oppressed. That's what a lot of people think. God is on the side of the oppressed. Amnesty International estimates that there are more oppressed people in the world today of the communist era than at any time in history. Oppression can come from religious fundamentalism, dictators, or oppressive regimes. It can be oppression of a group of people within a society. The oppressed can be women, they could be children, ethnic clans, and caste systems. It is easy to be blind to oppression in one's own backyard. It is just as easy as to be blind to oppression in distant lands and places. Professor Jim Lubin, in his classic The Prophets and the Powerless, reminds us that the powerless are special groups of people in the Old Testament. They are the widows, the orphans, and poor, and the strangers. 
Isaiah, Amos, and other prophets denounce the powerful who hold the praise down. Because God is God of the praise. So there is the temptation for arrogance in power. In Egypt and Mesopotamia, the ruler could be exalted to a superhuman, even the same divine position. Rulers such as the king of, in Egypt easily become arrogant, intoxicated with power, and lift themselves above the rulers of common descent. Meanwhile, there is a great yearning in human hearts and lives for deliverance. So the deliverance may not only be social, but personal. The yearning for deliverance and wholeness is intense today because men feel so fractured and torn. I had had so many healing sermons, so many healing services on deliverance. We want our lives to be happy. We want to experience grace. That's why all these deliverance services are taking place. The wondrous message of scripture is that God brings a deliverer. For the people of Israel, it would be the one who was drawn out of the water, Moses. For all humanity, Moses is a type of the one to come at Bethlehem. Christ is the deliverer of deliverers. He is the one in charge. I want to be saved and saved from whatever would threaten me and my family. I yearn for hope and purpose. My, pep my hope is not built on my stocks and bones. My government is military on my human structures and institutions. My hope and salvation is Christ and him crucified. is the only one where my hope is laid. When we know we are Moses too, having been drawn from the waters of baptism, we move forward, free, delivered in faith, with the joy and anticipation of what God has store for us. So to say thanks be to God. I want to thank God because that's where my hope is. When I was delivered from the jaws of the devil, today I am what I am. And I thank God for that. There are many people who have been delivered by Jesus Christ. And today their life has been changed. For those who are Christians, deliverance is very important. Because we need that. So that we move on, we have a focus there is Jesus Christ, who is the deliverer of deliverers. He has delivered men. He can do that to you. As long as you come before him and ask for him to deliver you from the ropes that are from the chains of the devil, you will be able to rescue. We need to be rescued. The world is suffering. Is suffering from people who are suffering, who are under the oppression of sin, who cannot see sin as sin, who pronounce evil to be good. And that's where we need the deliverer. If all leaders have been delivered, there's less suffering in the world. Because they would know what God wants them to do. So we are calling upon all the leaders who are in positions to acknowledge the presence of Christ, to acknowledge the presence of God in their lives. When they do that, they'll be delivered. And when they are delivered, you will see things changing. When people will be able to acknowledge that God is there. A lot of people who are saying there's no God they need deliverance. They need deliverance. And today, we are talking about it. Deliverance is needed in every corner, in every sphere. May the good Lord help you. As you understand that, as you are listening to this message, that deliverance is needed. Not only by us, not only by you, but by the rest of the world needs deliverance. May the good Lord bless you as you understand that yes, we need to be delivered because our hope lies in Jesus Christ. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your greatest gift of life in sending the Lord Jesus to die for us on the cross that in so doing, he demonstrated his tremendous love for us. 
Lord, we know that we, we were saved and secure in Christ. But Lord, so often our mind gives away to many different kinds of fear. Fears within, fears are without. And sometimes we find that fear seems to overwhelm us. And yet you have told you, us in your way that perfect love casts out fear. Lord, we know that your love is perfect. And our love is weak. But it is when we are weak that the fears seem to flood our hearts and overwhelm our souls. And yet your word says that when we are weak, we are strong. Help us, Lord, to combat this fear and raise our weary, frightened souls at your feet. Help us, Lord, to understand these comforting ways to know how we have, how we can apply them to our lives. Heavenly Father, we need deliverance in our lives. Teach us to acknowledge and walk in spirit and truth. Help us to take every fearful thought captive and hand it over to you in prayer and praise. The instance that arises in our hearts enables us in the power of your Holy Spirit to allow your strength to be made perfect in our weakness, knowing that the Holy Spirit of God who indwells in us is greater than all the combined worries, anxieties, fear, and problems that we have put together. Thank you that in Jesus we can find our strength and our deliverance. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Deliver us as we pray from the life into which we have now become so embroiled to retain us the joy of our salvation. Deliver us from this fleshly mindset that has swamped the heart of Christ from whom we gained such joy and peace. Lord, we come before you broken hearted truly sorry for our sins and rebellious ways. We want to turn away from all this flesh lust and look to Jesus, whom we know is the only secure deliverer from all that we have become so embroiled in. Thank you that even though we have proved so faithless, you have remained faithful and true. Cleanse us and wash us and renew us right spirit within us. May we sing to your praise and glory unto our lives end. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.